Well, good evening, everyone. I hope you're all having a great Sunday evening. Hopefully, you're gathered together in your living room and you're having a home devotional with your family. Uh, that's one of the good things that can come out of this whole coronavirus situation is we can begin having home devotionals with our family, uh, maybe in a way that we've never done before. And that's a really, really good thing. I want to follow up on the lesson that we had from this morning as I introduce the great book of Genesis. Hopefully you'll make it a point to begin reading and studying that very hard over the next couple of months as I'll be preaching through it. Just such a foundational book for our understanding of Christianity. Uh, obviously, this being the very book of beginnings, it does provide the whole foundation for uh, all of Christianity. And uh, that's such a wonderful thing for all of us. As we talked about this morning, uh, the book of Genesis uh, is a foundational book, for, a historical foundational book for Christianity. It provides the fact that Christianity is a religion that's not based on myth, it's not based on fairy tale. It is based upon facts and factual truths that actually happened. The stories that we call them that are recorded in the book of Genesis are not fictional. Those are real, true events that actually happened, beginning with the great creation of God. And uh, that's something I think that's very important for us to keep in mind, especially in our very secular culture in which we happen to live. Uh, we saw this morning this overall structure of the book of Genesis. Genesis is not thrown together. Uh, need, no book of the Bible is thrown together. God was inspiring Moses, who wrote the book of Genesis. But Moses also used his own creativity and structure when he put this book together. And uh, it's structured in a very uh, important kind of way that gives us clues to, to what he's trying to get across. You see the structure right here, as we talked about this morning. Uh, each section of the book of Genesis is introduced by this little formula, the generations of the, that Hebrew word toldot. Uh, and that indicates when he's beginning a new section or new teaching. And these teachings are true historical stories about uh you know, the creation of the world and Adam and Eve and Noah and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and so forth. But they're also spiritual truths that God wants to communicate to us who live so much longer after these uh, events happened. And you see the big picture of the book of Genesis, uh, the first 11 chapters, we're going to spend a lot of time studying that because that's very foundational, especially in this world when God and the things of God and creation and those kind of things are being attacked. Uh, those first 11 chapters are very, very important for us to understand why we are here, how we got here, what our purpose in the world is, and those kind of things. And then chapters 12 through 50 describe the patriarchal history. Patriarch is just a, a big word that means fathers as heads of households, how God worked through those fathers like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and so forth. And how we also, as people today, how we need to be at work uh, in leading our families and in following the voice of God. Um, this great verse that we all know, the very first words of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, says, In the beginning, God. And that seems so fundamental. And I know, hopefully, most of you who are watching this, you certainly believe that. But as you know, that has come under attack. Um, but the Bible says, and I believe it, and because Scripture is inspired from God, that in the beginning, what was in the beginning was not nothing. In the beginning has always been God. God has ever, always been there. And by in the beginning, he means even before the universe itself was created, before there was anything, there has always been God. And in the beginning, it said that God, he's the one who created the heavens and the earth. And the whole point of the book of Genesis, as we talked about this morning, I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding sometimes with people. We think that God is a God of grace when you get to the New Testament, but during Old Testament times, uh, God wasn't so much a God of grace. That's actually not true. God's nature hasn't changed at all. God has always been a God of incredible grace. And that's one of the things we're going to see in the book of Genesis. We saw that this morning, if you were there at the service or you watched it online. Uh, all throughout the book of Genesis, you see God showing incredible grace to people. Like with Adam and Eve, yes, they sinned. And God told them, in the day you eat of it, you'll surely die. But he didn't kill them that instant. 
the death process began in them, which would not have begun if they would have listened to God and obeyed him. But he had grace on them, and he made clothing for them to cover them. And God's grace is evident throughout all the stories that are recorded in the book of Genesis. And God's grace certainly is, is evident in our lives. And this, this great verse in the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 20, is really the theme of the book of Genesis, even though it's in another book. Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. And this is good for all of us to know. No matter how bad you or I have messed up, we cannot sin so much or mess up so bad that God is unwilling to cover our mess ups. Where sin increases, God's grace increases all the more. God has way more grace than we have sin. And that's good to know. That's a powerful message. We all need that. I need grace. Uh, if we're all honest with ourselves, we know you need grace. We all need grace. We all we all need what God has to offer. Um, I want us to think about this picture that you see before you here on your screen. I, I'm sure many of us have done this. Uh, we're looking up into the night sky, and we're just in awe of God's creation. We're in awe of all the stars. And when you think about the distance and the size and the expanse of this universe, it's awe-inspiring. I remember one time when I was a teenager, our youth group, this was in the, the early 80s, we went to this place in South Texas, south of Odessa, uh, out in the middle of nowhere, uh, called Sanderson, Texas. And I remember we spent the night out there, just some, some guys out there from our youth group. And I've never seen the stars that vivid in my life. There were no city lights to block anything. Uh, it was a clear night. The stars were just hanging down so vividly, so big and bright. It's one of the most awesome sights I've ever seen. And when you see things like that, like it's pictured right here, you just wonder how did this all get here? And you, it makes you feel uh, in awe of our Creator. Of course, we believe that's how everything got here. God put it here. God made it. He created it out of nothing. Uh, and... and and just the size and the scope of our universe just gives us a, a hint to the incredible power of God. I want you to look at these images for a second. I want you to think about it. Right here, you see a picture of the sun. And you see down in the lower left corner, that is the earth compared to the sun. Now, the earth is big. The earth is approximately 25,000 miles around in circumference. As we know, Texas is big. The United States is big. The earth is actually big. But compared to the sun, we're just a little speck. The sun is huge compared to the earth. And then what you see in the upper right-hand corner compared to the sun, that's another star. That star is called Rigel, which is one of the biggest stars that we know of. This star is gigantic. It would, it's huge compared to our sun. This just gives you some idea of the scale of things in our universe. And these are just things that we know about. And I'm sure there's you know, obviously a lot of things that God created that we don't know about. When you think about our earth, uh, one thing that we have all been told, we were all told, you know, if you had astronomy class or natural history class when you were growing up in school, we've all been told that we live on just a, a very average kind of a planet and our star, the sun that we wrote, that we revolve around is just a very average star. We've all been told that. This, In other words, the impression that's being given through science books and through the culture in which we live today, is this is just a very normal kind of situation that we have going on here on Earth, and we have a very normal kind of star, and everything's normal. This is probably going on lots of other places, life in, in the universe, in our galaxy. We just haven't discovered it yet. I'm sure you've been told something like that. Uh, that's actually not true. The sun is not just an average star. Now, it's uh, it's kind of average in size in some ways, but our distance from the sun and the amount of light and energy we receive from the sun is not normal at all. We haven't found that going on anywhere else. And the planet on which we live is anything but normal. Uh, our Earth is uniquely situated for life. It's almost like somebody planned it that way? There are so many processes going on earth and so many variables have to be lined up exactly right in order for life to exist on this earth. If we were just a little bit farther from the sun or just a little bit closer to the sun, life would not be, be able to exist. 
the tilt of the Earth on its axis, which is tilted at about 23 degrees, is what creates the seasons for us. Right here, right now, as we're recording this in June, we just had the first day of summer the other day, it is now it's summer in the northern hemisphere. We're actually further away from the sun right now than we are in winter in the northern hemisphere. And of course, down in the southern hemisphere right now, it's equivalent to about Christmas time. It is winter for them. So what provides the, the seasons is not the distance to the sun. It's actually the tilt of the earth on its axis. And a common explanation for how that happened today, what we're being told is, a giant meteor ran into the earth and just happened to accidentally tilt it at just the right angle, 23 degrees, that makes all the seasons and everything work so great. I think that's ridiculous. Uh, I think there's another uh, much better understanding and explanation for it. Uh, as we talk about the size of our universe, I want to read something from the book that I have here that just gives us a little bit of an idea of the scale of our universe. Now, let me just read this very briefly. This is from a good commentary that I have on the book of Genesis. And he says in the midst of this, he talks about uh, Cambridge University physicist Stephen Hawking. And he has been called the most brilliant theoretical physicist since Einstein. And in one of his works, one of the books that he wrote, called A Brief History of Time, he says that our galaxy is an average-sized spiral galaxy that looks like other galaxies. He says it is 100,000 light-years across. Our galaxy is 100,000 light-years across. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. A light-year is the distance in which light travels in a year. Now let me give you an idea of how to figure that out. Light travels at the speed of 186,300 miles per second. So if you wanted to figure out how far it travels in a year, you would have to multiply how far it travels in a second, 186,300, by 60. That's how far it goes in a minute. And then you would multiply that by um, another 60. That's how far it goes in an hour. And then you would multiply that by 24. That's how long it goes in a day. And then you have to multiply that by 365. That's how far it goes in a year. And then you would have to multiply that by 100,000. That is the distance of the size of our galaxy. It's just mind-boggling. And then he goes on and he says, Each galaxy itself, our galaxy contains, he says, about 100,000 million stars that we can see with modern telescopes. 100,000 million. And then he says, our galaxy is one of some hundred thousand million other galaxies, and each of these contains about a hundred thousand million stars. And the average distance between these galaxies is about six hundred trillion miles. The size of our universe, and it's expanding also, it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. Scientists agree on that. The size of it is just mind-boggling, beyond your wildest imaginations. And so when you start thinking about this, you have to think about, well, how did all this get here? Well, there, there are lots of views, but there's really two primary views right now that are holding sway. And one view, and we've heard of both of these, of course, one of them is the Big Bang, which means that everything just spontaneously generated or just popped into existence out of nothing, and this explosion somehow produced incredible order and all the life and all the order that we see just came about by random processes. First there was nothing, and nothing blew up, and now we have everything, and everything ordered so precisely to where we just, aren't we lucky we happen to have life? That's the main theory that most people buy into these days, which I think is absolutely ridiculous. It's not scientific at all. It violates all kinds of scientific principles. Just to give you one, uh, it says the, the theory we're being propagated, uh, that's commonly propagated today, the Big Bang, says that everything's spontaneously generated, which means everything, all life and everything that we have just popped out of nothing. It popped out of non-life. That actually violates the law of science itself, which is the law of biogenesis. That's a scientific law that all scientists agree on. And the law of biogenesis says life comes from life, period. There are no exceptions to that. But what we're being told to buy into is, well, yeah, that's true, but in this one case, it did. 
everything just popped into existence out of nothing. And this incredible explosion created all this order in life that we see around us. I think it's a ridiculous explanation, but that's what we're being told to buy into. The other explanation makes a lot more sense and is exactly what the book of Genesis and other passages throughout the Old Testament tell us. That's creation. God, an intelligent being, he created all life and he created all the habitats that we see and he gave exact precision and order to everything that we see. That's what Genesis says. And I'm going to teach a lot more in depth on that in the coming weeks. And I think it'll be very, very beneficial for all of us. Uh, and so what we need to keep in mind is to go back to this slide that uh, we brought up at the very beginning. And this is important for all of us in our personal lives. In the beginning, there was God. There has always been God. And uh, God has always been there and is always go going to be there. In the beginning, there was God. That's how things got here. They got here because God was there first, life, and that intelligent life created this intelligent life that we see around us today. And to bring all this to a head, I love this, I love this passage in Colossians chapter 1 where Paul is, is remarking on some of these uh, creation events and he's giving significance to how it relates to our personal life. This is just a great verse says, the Son, talking about Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, meaning Jesus was there at creation as well and helped create the universe because he also is God as well as the Holy Spirit. All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. And then I love this part that's bolded. All things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. If you want to know what our purpose in life is, this verse right here in Colossians tells us, we have been created for God. We were created for God. We were created for him. And only in him do all things hold together, as Paul says right here. Uh, sometimes if you find your life falling apart, you might want to go back to this verse. Our lives usually fall apart when we don't have God at the center of things because only in Him, it says, do all things hold together. Our life is going to uh, generally hold together a lot better when we make God the center of everything and acknowledge Him and try to live the way that He has called us to live. And uh, another passage I want to read, this is the last one. This one's in the book of Acts, chapter 17, where Paul, in his great sermon on Mars Hill, he's talking to these Greeks and these Athenians. And listen to what he says in Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 24. He says, The God who made the world, and he made everything in it, he's the Lord of heaven and earth, and he doesn't live in temples built by human hands. He's not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he also marked out their appointed times and history in the boundaries of their lands. In other words, God is behind everything. The reason that you and I happen to live where we live and the reason that we happen to live in the time epoch in which we happen to live is because God planned it that way. He determined it that way. And then I love what he says in verse 27 and 28. God did all this so that they should seek the Lord and find him, though he is not far from every one of us. For in him, Paul says, we live and we move and we have our very being. God who created everything out of nothing. God who was there in the very beginning, who is before all things, and in him all things hold together. God is not far from us. Sometimes when we think about God, as we look out into the night sky, we think he's way out there somewhere, way beyond our solar system. Actually, God is very, very near. He's very present. And what God wants, as it says right here, he wants us to seek him. And he will make himself available so that we can find him. He's not far from us. In him is our very life. He says, in him we live and move and have our being. Everything that we have, that we are, 
our health, the very fact that we're able to breathe, our brain waves, the jobs that we have, the families we have, everything, everything comes from God. In Him, we live and move and have our being. And what God wants from all of us, He wants us to seek Him. And so as we begin this great study of the book of Genesis, which is all about God, and it's all about God's grace, God wants you to know, he wants me to know, he wants everybody in the world to know that he loves us unimaginably. He has incredible grace for us even when we sin. And God wants us to seek him with all all of our lives. And so I pray and hope that that's what you are doing and that you're leading your family to do the same. Uh, Once again, we, we miss everybody not being able to meet together regularly on Sunday nights like we used to do. That'll, that'll change in the future. This will all be something that's in the past. We'll all be able to meet together again regularly and enjoy one another's company and study and ask questions and interact with each other like we normally did on, on Sunday nights. And we'll be able to do that again. There will be a time when all this will be over. In the meantime, just know that God loves you. He has incredible grace for you. Where sin abounds, God's grace much more abounds. Everybody have a blessed day, and we'll be talking to you again soon.